Hello, welcome to our q and I hope you're having a good day. Hello. Oh, it's getting warmer here in Germany. I'm very happy about that. That very comfortable today with the warm water. I'm not a cold weather person. <laughs> oh, awesome. I see some of you are coming in. I hope you enjoyed the first day. And this q and I want to use to answer some of the questions that we had pre-submitted, but you can also always post the questions that you want to have answered in this uh, comment section. It's going to be a very casual q and I'm going to show you a few cool things. I have a few folders and things here to give you a bit of an understanding for manufacturing. So it's just some additional things I thought would be interesting to show you. Like here's the materials. Um, we're going to be looking at paper thickness because that's a question I've received. Um, I'm going to go over the different programs. I know that, look, we had only 90 minutes yesterday and I'm really trying to add as much as possible in the time that I have with you. Um, but I'm usually, when I do these um, like I do these trainings, I usually always do a minimum of three days and each day is at least two hours. It gives me a lot more time to go a more in-depth. But for the time that we had yesterday, I tried my best to give you as much as possible from a bird's eye view so that you can create a strategy for yourself and you can avoid the things that are going to get you into trouble. Now, for... Um, today, let's get started first showing you where the resources are and all the different um, additional things that we have in the group. Let me share my screen. Share my screen. And then I just share the whole window, makes it easier. So here I am in the room community. Let's go into our community. And you are in our community, in order to find things, the best way is to go to the classroom. The classroom has the workshop replay, yesterday's workshop, and it also has all the different goodies that we have. So just to show you and give you a bit of an idea of what is inside, this is our workbook. And the workbook is usually what I go through when I do training. Um, so I just scroll through it with you and you can, uh, you know, in your time, you can just um, look at it in more detail. So here are some photos of my own products. Um, it also is showing um, a few different examples of products that have inspired me and that do really well. It shows the market, how the market is um, set to move and develop. Um, it's projected to have really incredible growth. Um, here's a little screenshot of my account. <laughs> it shows seven days of sales. Um, and that just goes to show how our passions combined with stationery on a platform like Amazon that has an enormous amount of people interested in buying stuff can be a very powerful way to create a bigger business. Yesterday I mentioned I mostly sell in the US and a little bit in Canada and a little bit in Mexico. And here you can see <laughs> that it really is just a little bit in the other countries and mostly it is in the United States. It's like 99 point something percent of my sales are in the United States. Um, here are some more photos of some products. Here's a pile of my product and my client's product. I have worked with lots of different clients and um, we've done like one-on-one -on -one work, um, which by the way, I do not offer any longer because I often then, um, you know, people will wonder if I do still offer it. I do not offer it. There's just very rare occasions where I do and that's mostly, you know, collaborating with maybe an expert in a certain field, but maybe already has an audience and I, I think of a partnership or like a strategic, like a business partnership. <clears throat> but the way that I can support, if anyone wants to su have support to follow the exact steps that I have taken, that my clients have taken, I have 
a few examples of some successful clients as well with their monthly revenue. Yesterday was a question if this is yearly revenue. No, this is monthly revenue. Um, and current, I took the screenshot just yesterday. So it's very current. Um, and here just a few examples of people that have worked with my manufacturers and that I have supported to create um, journals. And not just journals, we also have created a lot of other types of products that are stationary products like affirmation cards, oracle cards, habit trackers. Um, I'm currently looking into creating these type of one page sheets for my niche. So any type of printed product does not always have to be a journal or a planner. This methodology applies to it. It's just that if you have like a product that's like a one pager, the customer journey is a little bit of a different one because you're not giving a lot of different exercises. You're helping them with one piece of the transformation. Possibly it could be like if the person needs to be organized more or let's say they have a business and they want to be writing down something specific, um, it helps with one portion. One thing that has always been extremely important to me, um, or not always, ever since I have become really successful, no, hold on, uh, the other way around. I used to create Amazon products and businesses purely based on numbers, purely based on data, not based on my own interest, not based on my own passions. And that really backfired quite badly because I didn't have enough interest in the product. I was not my own ideal client. I was never able to create a product as great as if it was a product that I want to use myself. Once I decided, hey, you know what? I'm only going to create products from now on that I'm really passionate about. Um, that's when I was able to also have a very different result in my business. <clears throat> Here are some prompts that you can use to help you reflect on the passion, we look at different markets, supply, um, demand. You have the demand report here as well. And we also talk about Google Trends here. Um, we have a really cool, let me show you, file with journal ideas, 100 journal and planner ideas. It, uh, and here you can walk through, or not walk through, like, Read through. <laughs> um, that might be, um, you know, something that can inspire you. We also have um, 33 specific journal and stationary niche ideas for coaches. So um, what I really like here is that there's some ideas that I would have otherwise uh, or, you know, not thought about um, for a coach. And what is, you know, I want to show you something that I thought it was so cool. A de digital detox kit. I thought that was really, really cool. But let me show you the one that was my favorite one here. Mm. Let me see. I think goal achievement badges are really cool. Something that could be also nice for kids. Um, interactive decision dice to help with decision problems. Uh, I think that was such a cool thing as well. Um, where is it? I'm not seeing it. No, I'm not seeing what I wanted to show you. I don't want to waste too much time. Maybe I'm just, um, yeah, I'm just not seeing it right now. Uh, if I come across it again and I think about it, I'll share it. I thought it was such a cool idea. Um, okay, we have a few more niche ideas. So this workbook has a ton of different ideas. And these ideas are there to inspire you because there might be an idea that you come across where you feel like a glimmer, like, oh, this is exciting. And that's what you can then explore as well. <clears throat> Here's another resource where you can see like different types of general planners. And here we are talking about the pages like there time-based planners, they're goal-based planners, they're creative type of journals, they're reflective type of journals. So there's like all sorts of different types um, that you can look at to get a little bit of an idea like, oh, well, I rather would like to have like a time-based or mine is more like a goal-based type of planner. Mm. 
next we go through our signature program of how we come up with content and here's a bit of um, an exercise again that you can fill out and also use ChatGPT. Um, here's some examples of how we get closer to our idea customer and then we map solutions for their problems because as we were talking about it yesterday our product is never just a paper. People are not just buying a book for the sake of being a book. But sometimes we do because it looks pretty. So sometimes we buy things just for the sake because it's pretty. But in most cases, when we're buying like something like that, we want a certain transformation. Um, so a transformation is often a desire because the person is not there yet. And the gap between where they are and where they want to go is often what people perceive as the problem or they have a situation that feels like a problem, like having a lot of debt, for example. Now you want to map out what the problem is and what the possible solutions could be that your product would offer. So this is another exercise in here as well. I don't wanna to take too much time here showing you, but you see there's a lot of different exercises. It's really worth going through it. Um, and uh, we tend to go into quite a bit of detail here. And here's an example of my first KDP planner, which was KD, uh, you know, ADHD planner, which was on KDP. This is how it looked like. And this is how it then became a physical product. Um, at that time, when I researched the niche KDP, it happened to be a market gap. Um, Anytime there's a new market gap for different type of niches. So I always like to uh, keep an open eye and mind to find new niches, uh, especially if you want to start with print on demand first and then move on to a physical product, which is what I did uh, in my situation. I also did it with a um, manifestation journal. I did exactly the same. I started with the manifestation to my own KDP first, and then I moved on into physical. I was just looking around to see if I have it somewhere here to show, but it's somewhere behind me. Um, okay, so here, that's the workbook. Um, as you see, it's quite a bit. It also talks a little bit all about personal brand building. Now, this is just our free resource and our memberships, and I want to show you the memberships as well. We go into all of this in more detail and we have a lot more time. So our memberships, KDP memberships are monthly, but we do have Dunes and Planners Pro, which is a one year program. And I wanna show you how that is from the inside and what does what for those of you who want additional support. So Dunes and Planners Pro is basically, let's look from the inside. Um, it's a group coaching program as 12 months long, and it goes through everything that we have in the workbook and the things that we covered yesterday in more detail. And with weekly calls, not only with me, but we also have calls with manufacturing. As you can see here, there is a manufacturing call happening tomorrow morning. Oh, wait, tonight in the US. Um, US time. So tonight, if you wanted to join, if you join today, you could possibly still be able to make it to the manufacturing call with our manufacturer. Um, we have calls with me, as you can see here. We also have calls with our content um, coach with another manufacturer. And then we also have guest speakers. Um, this is purely to create a physical journal from start to finish. We also have the KDP Club, which is the print-on-demand version of the Journeys and Planners Pro. The Journeys and Planners Pro is purely for physical products, and that can be any type of physical stationary product and connecting you exactly with my manufacturers. Um, three different types of manufacturers that I connect you with, also with lawyers that I have worked with, <clears throat> with designers that I have worked with, with logistic companies. Basically, I give you my contacts in the industry, which I promise you there's probably not <laughs> a seven-figure Amazon 
um, seller that does that <laughs> so openly. And people ask me, why do I do that? Um, is the market not going to be all crowded if everyone's going to do this? No. Have you looked at the journalists and planners niche sheet? It has over 100 niches. Um, there is constantly new niches evolving. Not everyone is going to have the same interest. I have interest for possibly like up to like five niches, uh, journal niches. I will never create a garden journal. I will never create a camping journal. I will never create um, any religious type of journal because that's not my passion. That's not something that I would want to go into. I have a lot of customers that go into topics that I would never go into. And my vision is to bring the world impact through journaling and impact through guided journals and, the, and planners, of course, and other stationary products. And there is so much room. I would never be able to fill it. I would have to create 10,000, 10, 10, sorry, that was a difficult one. I would have to create 10,000 of journals to be able to ever create enough to please the world. I will never be able to do that. It's not realistic at all. And I have worked with many clients of mine, even one-on-one -on -one clients where I have helped them become my competitor with a product. And that is because the market is still pretty undersaturated in many niches. And because I didn't see a loss in sales for my on my end, I just saw that they also sold, I sold, and more options for the clients. This has been my mindset around this for the past years, and it has worked very well. A lot of people were a little bit skeptic, skeptical, honestly, that I was, you know, open this uh, and I was sharing this openly. But I've worked with so many people one on one. I've worked so, with so many people now through the memberships. And um, there's been very few situations, mostly only with my KDP, but with my physical products, I've never had a situation um, where there was something unethical happening. And that is because people who uh, come and join me in Journalism Planners Pro and the, the stationary enthusiasts, they want to create their own stationary brand. They're usually people that, that are not coming in with ill intentions. They're usually people that have a passion, that are super excited. They've never seen that this is something that was offered somewhere. They always been thinking about creating a stationary brand and we're just not sure how to do that. And amazing community and I found that I've all my um, group coaching programs the product on school the same thing have attracted amazing people that all work on their own passion items so I know I get this question a lot but I just want to emphasize that I'm doing this on purpose I really want to bring this out into the world and I don't see us competing. I see us working alongside creating a lot of stationary products in the world. And I have a deep belief that the stationary world is going to change a lot in the coming years. And it's going to be similar to all the personal development books that have been coming up in the last 50 years, 70 years. More and more personal development books have been coming up. It's not been the same situation for guided journals yet and I think this is just a time where guided journals are also going to go into this direction and there's been some statistics that I've been going through um, some business statistics that, I, that were not created by me but um, created by people that professionally create business statistics and there is some projection there as well that just from 2022 to uh, um, 2028 almost that there is an increase of 30 plus percent in the industry, which is a lot. A lot of people are um, getting into the paper stationery as a buy, like a lot of people buying it. And there's a need for people to offer it and offer better things. I'm sure everyone here has bought a journal or a planner and been disappointed that it's not really the quality, the quality that they have been wanting for themselves. Okay, here is um, a little bit of 
if you go to the workshop uh, workbook, you will also find the link to my Pinterest board. It's called Stationary Product Ideas. And I keep pinning new stationary products in here whenever I see something on Pinterest. And you'll see there's tons of different stationary product ideas. It's actually a pretty long um, list of beautiful things. And, and we have a lot of people on this list as well. And sometimes other people are also adding to it too. <clears throat> Good. Then I want to um ah, I wanted to be really clear about Junus and Planners Pro does not talk about selling on Amazon. On if you want to learn how to sell it on Amazon, that's what the product loan school is. I know that it can be a little bit confusing, but I want to make it very clear. I have two group programs. One is the creation and manufacturing. So it's all about getting it manufactured, get it created, designed. And the other program is get it launched on Amazon and get the sales. So it's, it goes hand in hand, but not everyone wants to sell on Amazon. That's why it's separate. For this um, you know, school event that we have here, we do have a special promotion where we have an all access pass. It basically means you get access to all of my membership. The how to create the physical planners, the Amazon portion, how to sell it on Amazon, plus the KDP portion. Let me show you the KDP, and then I will go into the questions in a moment. So this is the KDP portion, and this is the Royalties Accelerator. That's where you can get, um, I can show you, all sorts of different journal um, templates. And every month we add new templates that we find based on the trend report. So we look at the trend report, we identify certain niches, and then we create new ones. So we have constantly new things coming up. Um, and then all sorts of templates that will support you. We have thousands and thousands of template pages here that you can use. And you can mix and match. You can do the things that um, that you need to create your very own journal planner coloring book. Look, we have also tons of coloring books <laughs> uh, in the lots of different topics too. Good. Okay, so that's all the memberships that we have. And with the all access pass, you get um, access to all of them for 12 months and to all of the group calls. And I get the, uh, the uh, question, well, but should I start everything at once? You don't have to. You are free to do what you need to do at what, you know, how you want to start it. In 12 months, yes, it is enough time to start with KDP and create a physical product business. Good. Now let me get to the question. <laughs> I hope I, I covered everything. If there's any additional questions, please always let me know. I'm more than happy to answer any additional questions. Um, then let me go to the community. Here we go. So for today's Q&A, we have the opportunity to win a 100 Amazon card. And that is going to lead to a additional mini training that I'm going to do on a topic. I'm going to start by answering all the questions and then I'm going to let you know who the winner is. And then tomorrow we have a mini training um, for the topic. So let's look at this one here. Vivian is asking, can you please explain the best way to strategize for your journal launch? <clears throat> The best way to strategize for a journal launch is by doing the market research initially. Well, a product that was well researched means that there's a market there and there's a bit of a market gap as well. So it means that there's not too many competitors. You're not competing with sharks. Um, if you select your product well and then create something that is going to stand out, the launching by itself is not really that difficult anymore. A good product is launched easily. Um, 
a bad product, you can have the best launching strategy and it won't work as well. So that's why I have such a strong focus on market research. And I have all my clients always were research the niche first and validate the niche. That's what we do a lot also in the group coaching calls. You can come to me and we can validate your idea because that is an essential piece of having a successful launch later on. Now, you don't need to have an audience in order to launch. I don't have an audience um, for my product. I only have an audience for my coaching business, which is totally separate to my product business. So I don't have an audience here and I don't need an audience um, because I purely launch through Amazon ads. So far, um, for this launch, I have spent not a lot yet, uh, around $150 so far. Um, yesterday, I got seven sales. Before I came on today, I already got three sales. So the sales are already picking up. Um, I'm wanting to get to the 20 sales a day mark, probably 30 sooner than later. But I'm very happy with how how it is going considering this product has been live this product has been live less than two weeks and the reason why it is already working so well is because the niche was researched ahead of time so that's the best way to prepare for a launch by the way i want to show you something else before i go to the next question um, as part of the all access pass you actually get access to my behind the scenes. So behind the scenes is a, I mean, secret community. It's only for my clients. Um, and in my community, I share my exact strategy, how I prep for my launch, what I did when my Amazon account was shut down, what exact email I sent them. Everything is shared in here. <clears throat> and I also share regular updates, videos with my next steps showing behind the scenes of how I do it. Um, and that's a bonus that I also give. And my goal with this brand is to get to $85,000 in revenue per month within this year so that this is going to be on the way to make being a seven-figure business on its own. Um, yeah, so this is um, something that um, people that join also get access to where you can see me very transparently share <laughs> all the thoughts, also the ugly thoughts, because it's just part of having a business. You know, there's, there's no business of just everything is shiny and nice. And often the things that are not are shiny and nice. It's mostly just internal work. It's mostly like, you know, emotional stuff that comes up, but Regardless, everyone is going to experience that. And, and it's good to, to see that you're not the only one. We all experience the same things. Uh, it doesn't mean, you know, you're lazy or whatever. It's, it's normal. It's okay. We all have that. Um, and I try, to, uh, I've, I try to become more transparent over time because um, it's not always easy to be vulnerable, but I think it's essential and important because... I benefited so much from other people who have been willingly transparent and vulnerable online and not like the fake vulnerability, but like just real, like telling it how it is. And that has given me so much reassurance that there's nothing wrong with me that I can also do this. Um, so, yeah. Veronica is asking, um, I am always on the fence about quality from KDP and the number of pages because my main concern would be pricing too much and not get great quality books through KDP. Yes, that can be a concern. This is a KDP book. A KDP book is more like, um, yeah, I mean, it's a paperback book. You want to be looking at the page numbers. For KDP, I don't recommend getting over 200 pages. It's a pricing concern and also it gets too thick. KDP will not lay flat. So the thicker the book, the harder it is to use it from a customer's perspective. This um, journal here, I think, has 150, yeah, 150 pages, which I think is a nice thickness 
where the person doesn't feel like they're getting a magazine, basically like something super thin, but where it's just thick enough so it feels like something tangible, but it's not that thick that it's it becomes user unfriendly. Now I find with KDP you can play, I have all KDP always in black and white and grayscale. And I think with grayscale you can make the paper look as if it has more quality than it truly has. And I find it helps. I'm not sure you can properly see this on the camera, um, but that's something I find can help. But yes, the paper quality is not going to be the same as the manufactured product. It's because of the paper thickness. When it comes to journals, the paper thickness makes a difference. So um, a book page is a lot thinner than what we usually produce. So my pages usually have 100 milligram um, thickness. MDM, milligrams per meter. That's how it is calculated in the printing world. Um, and 100 grams, 100, not milligrams, what am I talking about? 100 grams. <laughs> I'm not sure how it came to milligrams. 100 grams per meter. Yeah. So that's what I tend to do. I also brought you ladies some paper samples that I will be able to show you just after we complete um, the question. So I brought a few different samples. Through the camera, it might not be as easy to see, but I can explain roughly, and you might be able to see a little bit. If you can't see enough, at least we tried, but you can take some notes so that you know what type of paper you love. Jenna's asking, thank you. I am super inspired and appreciate all the gifts. I would love to know tips and advice on how to create great content for journalists and planners. Example, how to make the content flow and make sense for the user. I have so many ideas and ton of content yet struggling with putting it all together cohesively. I would recommend going to the workbook that we have. And in the workbook, um, where did I put the, here is the workbook. In the workbook, when you scroll down, there is a portion where it is about first identifying your audience. You need to know your audience very well. I find it helpful if I'm my own audience because then I can really test for user friendliness. And I either sketch things out on paper or I print out templates to test it out. Is it really user friendly? Because digitally, something can sometimes look really like nice, but when you try to use it, it's not intuitive. And have you ever used a journal planner where you feel annoyed because of the questions that don't make sense or the layout just looks nice, but it's not really helpful? We want to avoid that. And we can avoid that by really testing the product ourselves. Or if we're creating something for a group of people, let's say you work with autistic kids, you would want to have a few autistic kids tested um, just to make sure that it really makes intuitive sense. Now, in order to do that, we need to understand our audience. Either you know them or you are your own audience. And then this is the thing that is really going to support you in creating content that is really helpful because you want to look at the customer journey and you want to look at what are the problems we're trying to solve with this journey. journal. We are trying to solve a problem with it and the problem of getting from A to B. So I would start by writing down the problems, the needs that the people have, what they want, and then the solutions. Don't censor yourself, write it all down. And then what I do, I use post-its and then I take a wall or I take a, um, you know, a whiteboard and then I map it out. So this is what we do here. I map it out and look at what is too much, what would I not want to use myself um, and what would be in order that makes sense. And this might take, you know, brainstorming, standing in front of your wall. I'm like, hmm, 
would I want to have two daily pages or would I want to have one daily page? Maybe taking a different journal out. I find it very helpful to take um, buy competitors' journals and look through them and then I see, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like this. <laughs> and by identifying things I don't like, I automatically know what I do like. So these are some small tricks that I find make all the difference to me and um, that's how I create in the product, really trying to make the problems that the person tries to solve, making solutions for that. And the solutions can be a page in a certain layout. It can be a certain exercise, prompts on a topic, um, a resource, maybe even like a meditation audio. It can be a few different things. Um, and I would note down and then clean it up again. If we really want to clean it up by reducing anything <laughs> that is not truly adding value. Um, so yeah, I recommend for that portion to go through this part of the workbook. It's going to really help you get clearer. This is also something that is great for the um, group coaching calls to come with a list of ideas and then together we can identify or we can give you feedback. There's often a lot more people on the call that can also give you additional feedback and um, to make it easier to move forward. <clears throat> Wendy, thank you so much. Um, is there a way to publish on Amazon KDP while having your own ISBN? Um, yes, it is possible. You can have your very own ISBN number. You don't need to use um, Amazon's ISBN number. Yeah. There are different pay places online where you can purchase them. I personally don't do it. I just work with the ISBN number that Amazon gives me. Um, I've gotten a message yesterday from one of the members here um, asking the same question about the ISBN number and because her goal was long term to have a publisher pick up her journal and then publish her journal. And I want to say something small to it. I do not see the benefit of a publishing house publishing your journal and mostly selling it on Amazon. It would just mean that you would get such a small fraction of the <laughs> of the profits, like you're going to get a very small piece of the profits and they're not going to do a lot of work for you, unfortunately. Um, they're also going to dictate what's going to be inside the book um, and having it manufactured, starting with a smaller quantity um, and then selling it directly is going to benefit you long term a lot more then having it done through a publisher, then who owns the rights, you don't own your work anymore and you get very small portion, very small portion. Um, I do not work with publishers at all because otherwise I would have not been able to build what I have now. Um, there are some bigger authors that work with publishers, but because it's just like one of the hundred different things that they do, right? Like they... They might have other businesses and a publishing house came to them and asked them if they wanted to do something like that. And that's how they created it. But that's not their main business. If you really want it to be a really great stream of income and a business that you could potentially sell, because from my personal long-term goals, when I'm thinking of like 10 years of now, from now, it's not the monthly profits that is the most interesting to me. The most interesting to me is that I'm building an asset that is worth a lot. So instead of me investing into property that I don't really know much about, I'm just doubling down on something I really know something about and I create different brands. And I cre I'm creating right now a portfolio of my own brands. I am now um, for the first time starting to do it with someone else as well or with two other people <clears throat> and the cool thing is not going to be just the profits but it's going to be that in three years i can sell these brands for millions and millions of dollars 
Um, and I built my net worth because these businesses, they gain in, in worth um, year after year as I'm adding more products, as I'm adding more revenue, like my business with these products behind me, I can sell for more than a million dollars. Imagine that, you know, like let's say something happens and I decide, you know what, I no longer want to do anything on the internet. I'm just going to cash out. I'm going to sell all my businesses. Um, then my Amazon business, my stationary businesses basically are going to really bring me a big cash out. Um, and that's very beneficial because it's not related um, to me having to work week after week after week. So that's another benefit. If you do it through um, a publisher, you have no right to sell it. So you could have many journals that are, in theory, worth a lot, but the publisher owns it. You don't own it. So for me, it's important. I want to create a portfolio of a lot of different brands that are going to be worth a lot of money and secure myself and my family forever while doing something that I'm really passionate about. And a few years ago, I could have not even conceived that this is a possibility in, in that sense, that something that we as general planner lovers are passionate about can become something so substantial and an asset that can be even more lucrative than even property or, you know, owning an apartment or owning something like that. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, what marketing methods have you found most effective to get the word out about your journals? Candice, I only use Amazon. Uh, I only use ads on Amazon. I don't do uh, social media at all for my brands. I want to change that this year because this year I want to grow to my first $500,000 month. And in order to do that, I think I will need to do some social media. Well, I don't, I think it would be beneficial to do so, some, some social media. But I went to $200,000 um, in a month's sales without um, doing any social media personally. I do, however, have some affiliates that are customers that have bought the product. The, um, this brand doesn't, but my other brand has a flyer that comes with every product and a QR code where people can sign up to become an affiliate. And we have quite a few now, more than 100 affiliates, and that also has supported sales, but this is a very passive way from my end. Um, to increase sales. Other than that, I've not done any outside marketing. I very honestly, when it comes to growing my existing Amazon business, most of my time is only spent in creating new products. I spend very little time in maintaining um, my business or in to marketing or anything like that because I do it purely through Amazon. And that's, again, why it's so important to research your product well ahead of time, because then it's your product ranks, it just gets sales, you do a bit of ads. And I know this sounds ultra simplified, but for me, that's my reality. Um, and why I love selling on Amazon, because Amazon just has millions and millions of customers that willingly, they are there to buy products. Um, I also have a Shopify store and almost no sales are coming from my Shopify store. So I would not recommend just starting directly in a Shopify store and trying with SEO unless you're like an ultra expert or you have like a massive audience. That's why I always go through a marketplace like Amazon because they do the fulfillment, they ship everything for me, they bring me the customer. I can just run ads there directly. It's the same platform, all in one. Yeah, pretty good. <clears throat> Mari is asking, what are the common pitfalls you can fall into during the publication process and how can we navigate these challenges successfully? During the publication process. Mm, I'm not... A I'm entirely sure if you mean during the launch or during the uploading of the product. 
during the uploading of the product, one of one common pitfall could be using someone else's brand name accidentally in your product. That can lead to your product being deactivated by Amazon. It can be very challenging to get it back. Um, another common pitfall um, during the uploading I think the uploading is pretty straightforward in the sense that you upload the title name, the description, the bullet points, basically the text, and then the photos and the price. Of course, having a wrong price can be dread can be horrible. Um, but I think the most common mistakes actually happen before and after during the public, like the actual uploading, that's when not as many mistakes happen. A lot of the mistakes happen when people have already created a product without validating if that's going to work on Amazon and then they try to sell it on Amazon and then they don't get the sales they were expecting because they never actually checked if that's something that people buy on Amazon. Another common pitfall is the some of the mistakes that I mentioned yesterday, poor quality, Having a price that is not going to let you be profitable, very common mistake. Um, having a product that is not researched well enough, not having a unique selling point, like basically not standing out. And another very common mistake is giving up too quickly. Um, thinking that when your product doesn't get sales immediately, that, oh, it just doesn't work when really you haven't experimented enough. Experimentation is always needed. While there are step by step by steps, every step can have some nuances that you will only figure out or know once you've tested it. So for every product, sometimes having a you know, the book being from this position says better than from that position. Like, it's just like sometimes very nuanced differences. That's why when we create photos, we try to create photos a little bit from the side, like this, because it has an effect. <laughs> so sometimes we just need to test things. We need to get more reviews. We might need to increase the price. Sometimes we get more sales with an increased price compared to a decreased price. Um, because decreased price are sometimes associated also with lower quality. Um, so there's, there's some nuances that require testing. And with every single launch that I have, it requires me to test a little bit until, you know, it gets there. And I see a lot of the mistakes that I see is black and white thinking in terms of like if it doesn't shoot up right away it's it's a failed product when really it, there's just a few days in between <laughs> of having to test or sometimes a few weeks in between of having to test something until you see it moves faster um so that's a very common thing that i see lack of long-term thinking no. <clears throat> okay josie is asking are you merchant fulfilling your own inventory? No, absolutely not. That would mean that I would have to ship hundreds and hundreds of products basically almost every day. And that would not be a free, like a business that I would enjoy. That would be, a, I would have to hire like a warehouse, hire staff. No, that's something that I would not want to manage. I do everything fulfilled by Amazon. Even I get some sales from Etsy, not a lot, but, you know, a few sales from Etsy now and then. And those are also fulfilled by Amazon. Amazon and my Etsy account are connected through a software. It's a free software that Amazon offers. And anytime I get an order on Etsy, it automatically is fulfilled by um, Amazon. So I do full Amazon fulfillment. That also means that they, they take care of um the customer service for me as well and returns all of that stuff because once you get thousands of orders every single month there is going to be some customer service i would have to hire someone um i have a very lean team when it comes to my amazon business it's me 
one um, ad person and my assistant that does like a little bit of part-time work supporting me with my um, physical product business. That's it. Very lean, very small team. Um, most of my team is really in the coaching side, um, which requires a lot more team. But my Amazon business is very lean um, because of the automation through Amazon. Amazon really makes this business be automated um, quite a bit. Do you need UPCs for KDP product? You don't. UPC for everyone else. For, to clarify, these are these product codes. Um, I don't have a UPC here, but usually when you buy anything, like here we have a product button. We also have a UPC here. It's the barcodes that every type of product has. We need that also for our physical product. And for KDP, Amazon provides an ISBN or their own Amazon barcode. Free of course, you don't need to get anything. Um, the lower cost startup would be pursuing the KDP creation path. Not necessarily. It is one possibility of doing that. There's also a lower um, investment um, path possibility of going, instead of for journals, going for other type of stationary products that are not mm, as labor intensive, that, that are simpler, simpler products. So this can, could be like um, pads, it could be habit trackers, it can be cards, it could be affirmation cards. A lot of these products, they have um, a smaller investment initially. So you could start with something like that. Um, just for reference, my first stationary product ever was a habit tracker. And a habit tracker, like a calendar that you put on the wall and then you just like tick off your habits that you have you know, completed every day. And that was less than a dollar in production. So I spent with um, shipping just around a thousand dollars something. Um, very affordable way to get started. KDP is also a way I've done that too. That's why I, I mean, I only share what I have done and KDP is a method. Some of you who are already experienced with um, Etsy or something like that, that would also be a, a method that can support um, building out funds. Um, but for me, it has been KDP. Another benefit with using KDP is getting a bit more familiar with um, keywords and things like that, um, that are going, that's going to benefit you as well when you have a physical product business. What kind of camera are you filming? Impeccable quality. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> um, this is the Sony Alpha 7 that I'm using. Um, now the question from Josie, what country? Uh, yeah, I'm in Germany. Um, another question here. Are you outsourcing the design of your pages? Do you use Canva? How do you, how do you margin your pages? KDP. Mostly Canva. I've also outsourced that to a designer. For a physical product, I purely outsource to a designer. I would not be able to create something like this. I'm not talented enough. When it comes to the margins, the manufacturer takes care of that. You send them the PDF and they will always they have their own designers and they will format it to match the mar margins perfectly. For KDP, um, there are different calculations through the KDP website that help you figure out the margins. In the KDP club, we do have some tutorials uh, of how to do that. Once you've seen how it's done, it's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> do you like to print smaller books? Um, is it Im impractical to print out 8.5 by 11 US letter size books? It isn't necessarily. I find it also practical. This is, again, personal preference, but it's going to be more expensive. So if you're competing with products that are selling something similar for cheaper, um, it is going to be hard to compete with something that is bigger because you, you have like much less of a margin. Something to consider. Mm. I, with physical books, go for the A5 size. For KDP, I go six by nine inches. That's my favorite size. 
How much stock do you buy and at what point do you make the reorder to restock the merchandise? At this point of time, I order in really big quantities. But when I got started, I always started with a thousand products first and test how well it is doing. And what I have found usually after the thousand, after I sold the first thousand, I always wanted to make some tiny changes. If I launched during September, October, I do recommend getting more pieces because that's a very busy season as well. In fact, if you are interested to launch by September and have Q4 be like a really good start of a business, and September can be a phenomenal month to launch a product because it can give you quite a lot, like, you know, a, a good swing. Now is the time to work on it um, because in order to be able to launch in September, you need to have your design ready in the next two months. Um, otherwise, it get, it's going to get too tight. Often I get people reaching out in September, can I still launch for Christmas? And that's unrealistic in most cases. It's too tight. So now is the time to prepare for Q4 for not only this um of course, Black Friday, Cyber Monday. There is an additional little um, Prime Day usually in Q4. And then, of course, Christmas holiday. So there's quite a few additional things that are happening. Mm. How do I make sure that I'm not out of stock? This has been a bit of a challenge because sometimes it can be unpredictable. I had a situation where I had a lot of stock or I thought I had a lot of stock, but I sold a lot more than expected. So what I try to do is I try to look at the velocity of how much I'm selling and forecast how much longer do I have. If I notice I have for less than two months, I must already have it reordered. <laughs> two months, although if I would be out of stock, ideally two and a half months, um, even three months is better. But right in the beginning, that's a little bit dif more difficult to do. Once you launch a new product, you first thousand pieces, it could be that after one month, you already want to reorder the next um, stock. And then at some point, it can make sense to order a little bit more. It often comes at a better price. You have some saving day, and then you don't have to keep ordering, keep ordering, and be nervous about running out of stock. Um, I have... Um, some clients that launched in January and are already on their third reorder because they've been selling so well and they order before they run out of stock. Okay. Um, do you have preferred KDP printers? So KDP, we don't work with printers with KDP. That's something that Amazon does. So KDP is just a short name for Kindle Direct Publishing. Amazon has their own printing facilities and they print. I do have my own printers that I work for physical products, manufacturers. I share the details with Judas and Planners Pro. It's part of the bonus. And if you look in Judas and Planners Pro, we do have calls with them. Twice a month we have calls and we're going to have a third call a month. These calls are there for you to ask questions directly, ask the manufacturer for samples, ask for more reference around different materials, different accessories. Um, and then we have a Google form where you can put your specifications of what it is that you want. And it will automatically be sent to, to all our three manufacturers so that you can get three quotes and compare them. Um, we are not affiliated at all. There's no benefit from our end if you go with any of them the benefit and the reason why we do it is because we want to have a really we want you to have a good experience if you read today's email you would have seen that um i have lost quite a lot of money through working with bad manufacturers and it took me many years to find great manufacturers i lost more than twenty thousand dollars by having products that the sample was great and then the quality was horrendous, wrong color, 
things were low. It was just, I've had lots of nightmares. Um, and it took me some patience <laughs> and really searching and searching and searching to find the ones that I'm now working with. With all the manufacturers that I recommend, I have spent at least $100,000. And we have had at least, I think each manufacturer has worked with more than seven or eight of my clients already, or even more by now. Um, yeah, much more like of my one-on-one -on -one clients. And then, of course, there's the journalists and planners pro clients as well. So these are people that have worked well with me and my clients have worked with them and are all happy. And this is such a really difficult piece. Um, and it makes such a big difference on your journey, having a manufacturer that is reliable with good quality. Very important one. Okay. Um, Nicole is asking, with all of your success now, what do you wish you could go back and tell yourself when you were first starting out? Oh, such a good question. I would ask myself to test more and respond less or react less emotionally charged. Like, I think especially in the beginning phases, doubts creep up so much because we have so little evidence that it is working right because we don't have evidence that it has worked for us already so in the beginning any type of small doubt can very quickly get you off the journey or off the road and have like a spiral effect like oh this is not going to work everyone else can do it but i'm not good enough and all of that happens the difference to people who who are confident at some point and who have success, it's just that they were able to stack more evidence over time. So over the years, I've been able to stack my evidence. I've got more evidence like this work and this work and this work. So when I have doubt, it doesn't really take me anywhere as quickly anymore because I have like more proof. Now, initially that was a lot harder. So I borrowed proof by looking at how it worked for others. And especially in the beginning, I find that mindset work is something not to overlook at all. Like really, it's something you, you want to do religiously, um, especially if you are anything like me and you tend to doubt quickly or doubt yourself or think that you won't be able to do things as well as others. Um, I have used a podcast it's called the product lawn uh, it's not called it. it's called the, uh, uh, the life coach school sorry the life coach school by brooke castillo and this podcast go back to her episodes from 2015 16 17 and listen to them that's something that has really supported me like i would my my baby was still in a pram. He was pretty young and I would every day go on a walk and listen and listen and listen. And I had to hype myself up. I really had to believe and collect stack evidence that I borrowed first before I could create my own evidence. And I had a lot of doubt because I had something, I had a previously failed business. So I had enough evidence that stacked against me. So... If I could go back and tell that Laura um, something, um, it would really be to uh, not react as much to the thoughts and experiment more and see it all more like a game and experimentation um, in removing that pressure. Because I think that pressure has often been leading to a bit of self-sabotage. Yeah, That's something that I would... And also reminding myself, you'll figure it out. Like there's, like when there's a portion, like often it was financial, like often I didn't have enough money at, at a certain time. Um, trusting that I will figure it out. Like there is a way, it's outside of my awareness. I get to brainstorm. I do not say like it is not available for me, like, keeping an open mind at all times and searching for solutions at all times and never say that something won't work. 
<clears throat> and that's something I did start at that point, but I would, if I could go back, I would be more enthusiastic about being resourceful, more enthusiastic about being having a positive outlook and just, you know, assume it's going to all work because in the end it did. But, you know, allow myself to assume that too, you know, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, Vanessa is asking, can you explain about the paper quality we should ask for when we get our journals manufactured? Please, some journals, journals I see in stores are let down by cheap quality paper that is not nice to write on. 100% agree. So, so important. Um, I keep showing my new journal because it's just in the forefront of my mind at the moment. But I think it's a good example too. So if you look at this journal on Amazon and you look through the reviews, you'll see how many people point, people point out how great the paper is. And I agree and I put a lot of effort in getting good paper. So let me tell you what exact paper I used. <laughs> I used 100 grams. It, the way that manufacturers write this, 100 G slash M grams per meter. This makes the paper, not being too thick that it makes it uncomfortable, but thick enough it won't bleed through. And what I've also done is instead of having a pure white paper, I opted for cream paper and matte. And that gives it a more luxurious feel. Um, and the quality feels a lot nicer because of that. Um, so I don't go below 100. Going even 120 can be very interesting. And now that we are on this topic, let me show you my paper sample. This is this was sent to me by my manufacturer of my shadow work journal. And we have different types of papers. Now on camera it's going to be a little bit hard to show all the different types of papers but here you see 100 gram ivory wood free paper um 120 gram this is white wood free paper this is a little bit thicker but i think it was not necessary to go just this thick do you see the difference in color i'm not sure if you can see that um, maybe you won't not sure um so i opted for this paper Give me one second. I'm going to turn on the lights. I noticed that I forgot to turn on the light and the sun went down. <laughs> oh, okay. Ha, more light now. <laughs> that will improve. Maybe you can see better now. Can you see? Not sure if you can see. Um, ah, hold on, because it's the same now. These are two different. Now, there's also 80 gram. 80 gram, you'll notice it's a lot more flimsy. And this is the paper that we often see in printers. Printers always, oh, not always, often have 80 grams or even 70 grams. We don't want to do that. That feels super thin and it bleeds through. Not great experience. 100 gram to 120 is what we want to go for. <clears throat> okay. Is it more profitable, profitable to create a physical product rather than KDP? I think I need a bit of a push to commit to outlaying the money on a physical product when KDP has no initial outlay. Yes, I'll, there's a massive difference. Um, I see KDP as a nice pocket money um, on the side. KDP, I would have to say, is because there's such an easy entry, it can become more competitive. So journals that worked well two years ago, and so they don't work well anymore for me, they know, because there's so much competition. On the physical product side, however, journals that worked very well for me two years ago, or three years ago even, still work very well now. It's very stable. There's not a lot of fluctuation of my journal not doing well anymore or something like that. On KDP, because um, it is a lot easier to entry, there's a lot more people that try to play that game, while the physical journal business is a lot 
less people trying to play the game, making it a lot more profitable. Also, not only that, um, by the nature of the product, we have a lot better room when it comes to uh, pricing. Now, when it comes to printing cost, KDP is more expensive than a physical journal. So I pay more printing per product to Amazon for a KDP journal than I pay to my manufacturers. Um, however, this product sells for often double the price or more than a KDP journal. So there's a lot more room for profit than I would ever have on a KDP journal. Here, my profit is often, in most cases, more than $10 uh, for my physical products, while on KDP, it's usually below $5. Mm, so that's one difference. And also the volume of sales is different. So the volume of sales with a physical product business is different. This is why I don't have a seven-figure KDP business while I have a seven-figure um, physical product business. Um, and the physical product business gains in worth and is an asset. So this business, which you, you have to imagine that I've built that in just a bit over three years, the business behind me, the books behind me, and I could sell this business for over $1 million. How crazy is that, right? Um, and I have already profited, like I already made my return on investment. So the money that I invested into the business, I already made my profit. On top of that, I built a, an asset. Like if I think about that, like that's really mind blowing to me. To do that with anything else, like even property or something else, like it would have never been that type of return investment. Of course, this is also business. Like I'm spending my time here as well, and I'm you know putting my ideas and and energy into it. But that on its own is what makes it so attractive. And seeing how the interest the industry is moving into creating more physical products, I can imagine that in five years from now, um, most of the journals on Amazon are actually going to be physical and there's going to be very little KDP left. The reason for it is that many buyers prefer physical product. And then for KDP, there's going to be something else. Um, all markets are always moving. So if you come in now as a physical product business, you're coming in, in the initial rush, right? And you can establish yourself as one of the initial players. And that can give you a competitive advantage. And there is one competitor that is quite known. Let me show you. So this is um, Clever Fox. Some of you might have already bought products from Clever Fox. Um, these, were, these are just a bunch of friends that started this on Amazon a few years ago. And they built into massive empire, making more than 50 million a year. Um, and which is really phenomenal. I mean, good, good on that. I, I think like I admire something like that. Um, you know, just having gone through it, gone for it. Um, and what they have is pretty basic sometimes and the reason they are doing the well as well as they're doing now is because they have been an early adopter look at many reviews a lot of the products have and how many different types of products they have they have like tons and tons and tons of different products and there's so many topics where there's not very much competition and there's room to become early adopters at this point of time where, um, plan, you know, guided planners, guided journals, guided workbooks and guide, like a lot of guided um, journals and planners or even transformational type of journals and planners is, um, is growing so much. So, yeah, that's why I'm so enthusiastic about it. <laughs> 
in order to start with KDP and then shift to a physical product this year, how much time do you think you would need to dedicate each week to moving through your programs? Mm. I would give it five hours a week, definitely. Um, I would attend co-working sessions. We have them every week with other members. Um, and those are extremely beneficial um, to not do it on your own. And in the co-working sessions, basically Zoom meetings between members where it's an accountability. So in the beginning of the session, everyone says, what are they going to be working on? There's silent co-working. And then at the end, there's reflection on how it went. And everyone has uh, been working on their progress. This, I, I personally use co-working a lot. Um, I use a service called Focusmate. Um, it's, I, was, I think it was developed specifically for people with ADHD that need body doubling. And I, having ADHD, I need a lot of body doubling to be productive. So I use co-working sessions. And um, we adapted that idea into our memberships. And that is something people are really liking a lot because it supports. Um, so that's something that you can continue and that you can have you support. Um, but yeah, roughly five hours a week is something I would recommend doing. Um, I am really someone who's very consistent when I create products. I recommend even just having a sprint, sometimes saying like, okay, I'm going to have like one weekend and that weekend I'm going to create my um, KDP journal. We have in the KDP club, we do have um, replays of create a journal in a weekend. Um, we have also create a journal in a week with, with one hour a day. Um, so we do have some additional um, programs that you can follow along. And that's how I tend to create products through sprints, not through working every day an hour on something. Like I'd rather have like a full weekend intensively working on it. And then at the end of the weekend, I'm done and I have it. And then I have a few more months where I'm not as, <laughs> you know, productive in the sense of creating a new product. Like I, I love that. And many people do prefer that. Other people prefer to, you know, do it by size. So you need to kind of look at what you prefer to do for yourself. Um, but setting deadlines, putting it in your calendar is going to really help a lot. Um, and then finding an accountability body, not doing it alone. <clears throat> and then you can definitely go from KDP to a physical product and launching on Amazon with a product. Or, um, within one year. Absolutely. Chris is asking about the first stock of 1,000 items. That sounds reasonable and also like a lot. <laughs> um, would a first stock of 400 and 500 journals make a good start or does the cost per piece for a smaller print run eat too deeply into the profit margins? Exactly. Often you pay exactly the same amount for 500 pieces than you would for 1,000 pieces because the price per piece difference from 500 to 1,000 can be quite drastic. There are cases where um, your journal, like 500 pieces, would cost $3 and 500 pieces would cost $2.20 or so. In that case, go ahead, start with the 500 first, but keep in mind that the risk of running out of stock very quickly and all of that is, is a lot bigger. And if it takes off, it's going to take two months or almost two and a half months until you have stock again. So that's something to keep in mind. There are also other ways of starting to pre-sell your book ahead of time before you even manufacture it. Maybe some people here have um, memberships. Maybe some people here have an audience. Maybe some people here are interested in doing Kickstarter campaigns. Some of the most famous journals, like, do you know the Passion Planner? Um, the Passion Planner is a very well-used um, planner all around the world. And this was started by a lovely lady through Kickstarter. So she sold, she only created a sample first, created a Kickstarter campaign, sold ahead of time. And then with the funds that she got through that, then she went to Manu you know, get it all manufactured and then shipped out. That's also a possibility. And we have um, shipping contacts 
and basic logistics contacts that we give you in Journalism Partners Pro as well, that would facilitate a scenario like that. So let's say you do Kickstarter, um, and we do have a Kickstarter um, guest experts also coming in to Journalism Partners Pro to share about it, because I personally have not gone that route. I have considered it a few times because I think it's such a phenomenal route to go of pre-selling your book first, um, after like creating it first, getting a sample, then pre-selling it and not investing into inventory just yet, getting the sales, then being profitable ahead of time. I think that's a phenomenal way of doing it. Um, however, you can only do that with new products, uh, with something that was not published before. And I considered it, but it it would uh, it was a new platform for me to learn when I already had like all the group coaching and all the other things. So. I didn't do that for this product, but maybe in the future, I'm still going to consider doing a Kickstarter campaign just to learn it uh, and to, uh, to, see, uh, to see because I've seen how beneficial that can be. Um, so that can also be a method. Um, there are also people that just sell it through social media, pre-sell, have like a pre-sell period through a simple website, se sell the first 500 pieces already if those have sold, order 1,500 from your manufacturer, have the shipping company ship it to the pre-orders and have the rest 1,000 sent to Amazon. And then you're already profitable. Everything is paid for, zero risk. And yeah, I mean, there are ways to be cre creative here as well. And there are ways that others have already done so successfully. There are some... Um, really well selling um, journals on Amazon that started through Kickstarter too, um, using that approach, which can be a nice alternative way. Okay, so we have some more questions. Let me remove this, this always looks a little bit trippy. Um, okay, question Do you know if you can make a journal based on someone's method, such as method for organizing, for organizing? Hold on. Such as method of organizing for an organizing journal. Now I get it. If you keep it general. Mm. If the method is very unique and it comes with a unique way of calling it, then I would probably not do that. But if it's like, if you are inspired by a way that someone else organizes things and you create your own organization journal out of it, as long as you don't use any anything that is copyrighted, no trademarks, and you're not using similar names that make it seem like it belongs someone else, I don't see any issue with that. Because if we look at planners, most planners, the layout is not fully 100% original, right? Like, most of the planners have been inspired by other planners. There are some that can be, you know, in a way unique, but for a daily planner, there's, you know, so much that you can do. So similar to other concepts like shadow work, it's not a unique concept. Shadow, uh, well, the concept, this book is not a fully unique concept. It's just my unique interpretation of the concept. Shadow work was invented by Professor Carl Jung. Professor Carl Jung died long time ago, however, so it is not copyrighted anymore. And um, I'm allowed to create something that references him. Um, so if someone is having like an active course in organization and they have like a certain methodology, then I would just make sure that it, it is really a little bit different in yours might be inspired by it but not exactly it <clears throat> Evelyn is saying I love the idea of building an asset oh me too I feel like that sense of security <clears throat> I like that and also building something substantial and in a way that is fun because I've been thinking of property um, but it intimidates me and I don't think it's as lucrative. Like I would have not gotten as quick results and I didn't really have the funds to, you know, to really play big. And I think in order to play 
well in something like property, you need to have significant funds in order to do well. And this was a way to create an asset and with that a net worth um, that kind of developed itself um, through the different products and that having value in its own. Chris is saying a thousand sounds recently. Ah, yeah, here we have that also in that. I can't wait to get mine. <laughs> Are they good? Ah, that's good to know about the pricing for 500,000. When I get quotes, I always ask for multiple quantity quotes. And also it gives room for negotiation. Something that we need to keep in mind. The first price that we get for something is never the actual price that we are going to buy it. Like negotiation is a must. And even if I reorder with the same manufacturer, I renegotiate. We always negotiate and it's just part of that business dance. Like, you know, it's like a, a bit of a custom, especially um, working with overseas manufacturers in China. Negotiation is just part of the culture as well, like you go to a market and everyone is negotiating with everyone, you know, and sometimes for people who are from, um, you know, the United States or Central Europe, especially for Germans, it can be like very awkward, like we want, this is the price and this is what I pay you, <laughs> I want certainty, <laughs> but it's different there and um, with, with practice, it gets a lot easier. So, to get back to um, the quote, I ask for 500, 1,000, or 3,000, 2,000, like a few different quantities. If I see that the $2,000 or $3,000 quantity is significantly um, more affordable, but I will try to talk to the manufacturer. If I really want to start with 500, I will reassure that I am planning to have a long-term relationship, that I'm planning to order more products but the first batch would have to be a smaller batch and if there is a possibility to have a better price because i've seen that at a thousand pieces and at two thousand pieces it's a lot more affordable and if they could already grant us a more affordable price so to really test the product and see uh but while you know still having some form of profit uh, and some manufacturers will then agree to give you a better price in an initial um, quote gets better. But something to remember is always the first price is never the price. N not the, the second price is also not the final price. The third or the fourth price, that's the final price that you, you want to pay. And not negotiating enough, I think, is also a very common mistake that um, first time um, business owners that, that are manufacturing for the first time do when they work with overseas manufacturers that they don't tend to negotiate enough and then overpay initially. And negotiation is also something we cover. Um, and within the Journalist and Planners Pro coaching calls, you can always bring the quotes to me. And we can look at the quotes and then together we can draft a negotiation email and a goal price. So you know, okay, this is my goal price. This is what we're wanting to aim for. And over time, you know, what we need to keep in mind, we want to have a win-win relationship with the manufacturer at all times. And in the end of the day, the person that we're talking to is not the owner of the factory. The person that we're talking to is a sales rep representative that lives from commission. Now, they only are going to be willing to take a cut in their commission by giving you a better price if they know that there's something long-term to gain from it as well, like a long-term relationship, more products that you bring to them. Um, predictability for sales um, representatives is, or, you know, constant... Um, predict, yeah, I, I guess predictability might be a, a word that can describe it. Very important for them because they live from commission too. Um, so if they know that this is a beneficial win-win situation, they will 
they will do their best to really nurture that relationship and they will try to give you a good price. But of course, initially, they will try their best to get the highest possible commission that they can. So, you know, uh, <laughs> see it a bit as a game. Never feel like offended if they, you know, try to have a higher price. It's just, you know, fair game. And even if we introduce them, they will, you know, there's this ace representative, they will still try. And that's why we we don't have our manufacturers within our community. All our coaching calls that are within us are private. And the manufacturer calls are with the manufacturers. So that means we can always negotiate, like talk about negotiation and you know, our strategies. Um, and also the manufacturers are not part of my team. Um, I'm just recommending who I have successfully worked with. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, their quotes, their initial quotes are the price to go for. So we still need to do all that. <clears throat> hope that makes sense. Okay. Thank, thanks for the Kickstarter info. That sounds like a wiser choice for less out-of-pocket cost, especially when there's a reliable manufacturer. Absolutely, this can be a phenomenal way to go around it and have, um, you know, sales first and then the manufacturing. Wonderful. Do we have any additional questions? I think I uh, have been, I've been able to go through all of the questions. Yeah, I don't see a new question here in the school community and here on uh, YouTube I don't see another question yet either wonderful uh, I want to remind you all to look at the resources that we have put in and um, also if you want to join the next manufacturing call which is tomorrow um, Hold on, it's tomorrow, China time. It's in the evening, US time. Um, if you want to join that, that's also possible through the um, all access pass. Um, what else? Um, yeah, the special bonus of the behind the scenes um, where I'm showing exactly what I'm doing behind the scenes. I show the ad campaigns that I have. I show how I created my listing, I show basically all the steps that I took, the things that I had to navigate, like the Amazon shutdown, account shutdown, and things like that too. Um, and that is also a bonus. So you get to see the behind the scenes. And the next piece of the behind the scenes now is going to be I'm developing a second product. Um, I'm wanting to create a product range for this new brand of mine. And this is going to be a different type of stationary product. It's not going to be a journal. It's going to be most likely some cards that will go well with this brand. So um, as part of the all access pass, you get the bonus of being able to um, look behind the scenes, how I exactly create this product, I get a sample, I manufacture it, and then I'm wanting to launch this in Q3, maybe end of Q3, um, potentially, and maybe it's going to be launched at Q4. Um, but yeah, that's the goal. And yeah, we're also going to be in China in May, so I probably show a little bit behind the scenes as well how that is. I'm going with a group of 10 wonderful ladies um, to the Canton Fair and to visit the manufacturers. So one of the manufacturers that we have the calls with, we're going to be visiting them. And um, yeah, quite a few exciting things happening. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, any questions, always let me know in the group. The group is still active. Um, there's going to be a few additional resources. I will name the winner of the Q&A. And I will create a mini um, training tomorrow to share that with you. And then, of course, send the Amazon gift card out. Thank you so much. And see you very soon. And have a beautiful rest of your day. Bye.
Can you drop the, oh, hold on, yes, just one second. I will drop the link. I saw this thing too. Yes. yes, link is dropped in the comments. Wonderful, see you then tomorrow. Have a beautiful day.